Hi, this is Daniel James Chan, and you're listening to the Quantum Leap Podcast. Hello, Leapers, and welcome back to the Quantum Leap Podcast, Quantum Leap After Show. I'm Albie, and as always with me is Hayden, I think. And uh, we this week we have back with us the lovely, the one, the only, John Irons. How you doing, John? I'm great. How are you? Is is that you, Hayden? Hello. My name is Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Bruce. <laughs> I'm just here to remind you that fish are friends, not food. Oh, for 100%. God's sake, Bruce, stop that. I told you not to get on camera. <sighs> Far out. Sorry, everyone. I'll get rid of him. Hayden's got a new pet shark. Friends are fish, not food, uh, because fish taste nasty. I don't know about you, but I don't eat seafood. John, you, you eat seafood? I had fish earlier tonight, so. Really? Sorry, um, Bruce. Tilapia? Typical. Uh, typical. I get the most badass uh, tattoo I can think of. He's like... <laughs> <laughs> you got a haircut, Hayden. Yeah, well, I went to Thailand a couple of weeks ago, and uh, tr- long hair and tropical climates don't mix. So, tell me about it. Tell me about it. I'm overheated as well. All right, yeah. today we're talking about season two, episode two, Ben and Teller. Well, you're not even going to ask about the tattoo first. <laughs> uh, did it hurt? Um, yes and no. Most of it was okay. Um, for context, I don't know if any of our leapers have been following, but I had some very bad scarring on my back for many, many years. Uh, it's from when I had some cancer cut out of me. Um, I might even give you, Albie, some, uh, some pictures of the before and after. You can put them up, um, just, just for context. And, uh, it was in like the shape of the, the head of the shark. So I thought I might make it as the, the mouth with the mouth open, the scarring, but uh, it ended up fitting better as the shape of the shark itself. And so, yeah, my shark bite, which is what I called it, is finally a shark bite. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Oh, I'm very um, happy to get those disgusting scars off my back. I'm allergic Both to figuratively shark. and literally. <laughs> I'm allergic to shark. Yeah, I, I break love out shark. in tooth marks. Delicious. I break out in tooth marks. Yeah, f- fish and chips here. It's always with flake, and flake is a type of shark. Yeah, yum yum. So yeah, Bruce, if rails. you shit me, I'm eating you. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> We're already off the wet rails. I just read your message. Okay. Um, <laughs> today we're talking about the Quantum Leap episode, season two, episode two of the new series, Ben and Teller. I thought this one was going to be about magicians. It is not. It's about a bank teller. Uh, it's almost see. like they told us in the title. <laughs> and we also have a great interview tonight with Sophia Castro. She edited the great episode SOS, if you remember that one, the one on the submarine with Superman. And she edited tonight's episode, Ben and Teller. And uh, she's done a few more episodes, and we'll talk about that in our interview later on. So uh, definitely want to s- stick around and check that out. This one was written by Andrita Mercurgi and uh, directed by Kristen Wendell. And the editor was uh, Christina Castro. And, uh, of course, cinematography was by Anna M. A. Marti. So we had a really good team on this episode making it so uh that's that's what we're talking about today i want to get uh john's first impressions welcome back to the show john everybody loves you i love you we all love you thank you uh, uh what are your everybody. first impressions of uh ben and teller i liked it i liked the the story i liked it, it was a, a relatively small uh intimate i mean it was a bank heist but it was you know it was a family story kind of um i like the story um I had some issues with it just visually, actually. Um, but I thought the acting was good. I thought the writing was 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 good. Um, I liked the back at HQ stuff as well. So um, I, uh, I wasn't on for the for the season premiere episode, but I loved the season premiere episode. Um, well, that makes this one was us. still this, <laughs> that makes most really of us. I, I li- sorry to interrupt you, John, but uh, Hayden, I, I listened to a bunch of different Quantum Leap podcasts about this episode, and it seems like you're the only one that didn't like it, but that's okay. That's your opinion. Okay, back to you, John. Everyone else no, is allowed to be wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, I liked it overall. I've got a 
a couple of complaints here and there, but overall, really good episode. Good, good. I'm sure we'll talk about those things. Uh, Hayden, what did you think of Ben and Teller? Well, I liked this one a lot better than the previous episode, and I think it actually is because of the fact that we got so much more from the project. I know that a lot of people had been complaining in season one that they didn't like having such a heavy focus on the project. I'm exactly the opposite. I want to see more project. I want to see more from uh, from Jen and from Ian and from Addison and from Magic. Um, I want to know what's going on with them, and I want them interacting with Ben on the lip. So uh, that's part of the reason I didn't like the previous episode very much because, yes, it was very leap heavy, but it just wasn't the one who I was invested in. I'm more invested in the project people at the moment. I don't know why. I mean, Ben, Ben's stories are great, but I just seem to be far more invested in the project at the moment. And um, having discovered that, you know, they've been offline for quite some time because Ben was missing for three years and seeing them try to pick up the pieces again, it's intriguing stuff. So, yeah, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm really enjoying what's going on at the moment. Oh, good. I'm glad you like this one better than the last one. Uh, I enjoyed this one just as much as I did the last one. Uh, I really liked it. I think it was another strong episode to start the season out. Um, it, I, of course, I had brought up memories of maybe the Promised Land. Was that the name of the episode, Hayden? The bank robbery in the original series? Yeah, that was the bank robbery one. Actually, I'm seeing parallels to the previous series as well, but not so much from Promised Land except for the the, the fact that it was um, in a bank robbery, bank. I'm getting mm-hmm. more MIA vibes because ah. what's going on? Exactly the same thing that happened to Al. Ben has been missing for a number of years. His wife, or in this case, fiance, is moving on and uh, got to try and get you know his life back together, everyone's lives back together, I suppose, um, into some way that they can function. Um, pretty much exactly the same as what happened to Al in the previous series did actually make me wonder, you know, is there some opposing force to GTF dubs that's like trying to balance everything out since everything went so well for Al in this uh, timeline, you know, does Ben need to suffer to, you know, put things back in balance? I don't know, but uh, there's, uh, you know, questions that come up when there are such obvious parallels. An interesting idea. I like I like the fact that you're thinking ahead and maybe uh, they're going to do something like MIA with it because that was uh, probably the most powerful uh, moment, if not one of the most powerful moments uh, of the original series was with uh, Al and Beth and what happened. So maybe maybe they're looking for that for the um, Ben and Addison relationship. Um, I can see a behind the scenes reason why they've decided to break Ben and Addison up. It's because Ben hasn't been getting his on over the first season. You know, sex sells. We need some on the show. So, Maybe, yeah. Yeah, we it's, need them broken I, up. The The only thing I'm struggling with so far this season is the Addison-Ben relationship. Um, I'm, I'm having trouble because I really think that Ben would have waited for Addison if the situation was reversed, or he would have... Uh, taking control of the situation, especially in a time travel project, knowing where she was previously and went and saved her, went and found her. Well, he did take control originally anyway, didn't he, to save Addison's life? Right, right. But if Ben is as altruistic as he's coming across, maybe he does have to realize that, yes, he saves Addison's life, but now it's her life to live. So she needs to be able to live her life. And if he's, for whatever reason, not able to you know, fulfill his duties as uh, her fiancé and husband, then maybe he does need to realise that he needs to let her go. That was a big issue that I actually had with the original series, the fact that Sam kept Donna on the hook for so long. We don't Mm -hmm. know what happened Mm -hmm. to Donna. Mm -hmm. When Sam originally leapt, um, we know that was a timeline where he wasn't married to Donna. But I think it was in the previous episode, we saw a flashback of Magic and Ben talking about, you know, what was Sam thinking when he left and left Donna? So obviously that timeline changed, but obviously, you know, he had to be there because he had to put that timeline in effect anyway. Uh, But, you know, how does he justify leaving his wife and, uh, you know, 
with the possibility of never coming back. And then Ben essentially does exactly the same thing. Um, and I really thought that in the original series, there should have been some sort of an episode where they resolve that and maybe um, Sam and, uh, realizes that he is married and either le leaps back to some point where he prevents Donna from marrying him so that she's free to live her own life or else um, gets in touch with her in present day and says, no, you've got to move on with your life now. So, Because it did seem very, at the time very... Mm, what's the word I'm looking for? It, 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 I think it would have hurt more the fact that he helped Donna get over her daddy issues, but then does exactly the same thing, which, you know, caused her to have those issues in the first place. If that makes sense, which is the abandonment. John, what do you think about Addison moving on? I'm fine with it. I'm fine with her moving on. Three years is a long time. It also, it, it seems kind of quick for you know the 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 buffy angel level true love that mm -hmm. they seem to be displaying um but also you know i get it if she was in the depths of despair and um new guy kind of helped pull her out of it i i get it um i feel like three years is like the least amount of time they could make that a reasonable argument like if it, if it had been a year that would not i wouldn't have bought it and and th three years i guess is understandable yeah and remember in the leap back um when obviously al's leapt to the same situation that he'd lived through with you know coming back from war and finding that his um fiance's moved on and they talk about it, and he's obviously very bitter until she says, I cried my eyes out for you for two years, and I still waited another year for you. So I waited three years, and that seemed to be enough to, you know, snap him out of it and, you know, make him forgive at least that woman. Whether or not he forgave Beth, I don't know. But I suppose he was more on the path of healing, you know. So I agree with you, John, that three years seems to be about the right amount of time to help, you know, it seems to be the statute of limitations. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering, um, I guess I'm in the, uh, I'm in the not Hayden camp. It's, it, I don't, I don't dislike the stuff at HQ as, as much as a lot of fans do. I like the stuff at HQ, but I also enjoyed last week when it was all about the leap. Uh, this year was a, was a good mix. Um, and to to tie it in with um with Addison, I was wondering if the if there was gonna be a season long arc or a kind of a, a wraparound and if in the um season finale, if that's a thing that gets corrected, is is that like he's not gone for three years or or that three years don't pass. The thing that shut the project down for three years, um, or for two years or whatever, like that doesn't happen, and so Addison's not with uh, not with new guy. Is it Tom? Tom. Right, Tom. Tom. Another Tom. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I so that I'm, I'm wondering if they're gonna um, you know timey why me that and and uh, fix it at, like later in the season. I actually don't know about that, John, because I think I, we haven't heard very much about GTF dubs throughout season one except for what magic said but at the start of season two in deborah pratt's narration um she did state that there is an unknown force leaving him around to put things right that once went wrong i think it's a deliberate move by gtf dubs to have so much time pass so that it's kind of like we're in mirror image when sam had to realize this is his life's work and had to cut his ties. I think it's a deliberate attempt by GTF dubs to try and help Ben maybe come to the same conclusion where, uh, and by doing this and having a substantial amount of time, it's also helping the others to move on and to come to terms with it as well. At least that's my interpretation from what I've seen so far. I think, I think John's on the right track just because uh, I don't know if you guys saw the uh, Chris Grimzer interview that we uh, got last minute last week and put in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
the, th- aren't we putting it in this episode? No, it was last episode. <laughs> was it? Okay. You don't want to show either. Okay. In that interview, I think uh, Matt and Chris were talking to Chris about the being in the near future because it's three years after uh, 2023 or 2022. So it must so. be 2026. 2025 yeah. or 26. Uh, and uh, Chris kind of said something about like, I don't know how long we're going to be in that time period. So mm. to me, that was like a little bit of a clue that there might be a undo or a fix. And also, I think they were talking about the mid-season finale, uh, which would be, a, I think, the end of episode eight, if I'm guessing correctly. That's just a guess. Matt yeah. would know more. But well, there think- is that chance, Alby, but it could also be we're seeing now that time actually does pass in present day while Ben is leaping, and it's obviously a variable mm-hmm. amount. Maybe we're going to see the the project side of things moving at a faster rate and ending up further and further in the future. Um, instead of seeing it go back to what should be present day, which is 2023. That's a possibility I didn't consider. Hmm. Um, I, I, th- this episode made me cry at the end. Uh, when Ben realized that Addison mm-hmm. moved on, I was heartbroken. Um, and oh, I don't know. I, I, I was trying to find some kind of sympathy for uh, the character of Addison, of what she's been through. But um, like when she's talking to Jen, you know, by the window, by the rocks, by the mountain, wherever they're in underground. Uh, and she said, you know, I buried him and I, I yelled. I actually yelled at my screen the first time I'm watching this. No, you didn't. You just assumed he was dead. There was no body. You buried an empty coffin or whatever. You just assumed he I was I think gone she metaphorically gone. meant buried him like with her feelings. She buried him. Yeah, but I, I, I honestly don't think Ben would have given up on her that quickly. So I don't know. I might be bringing my own, you know, history with relationships into this, but I, I was kind of angry with Addison. Yeah. And uh, well, you're welcome you know, to be. <laughs> I actually like, did find her very sympathetic, and I think it's partly because of the character of Tom. Because in MIA, like I couldn't stand the guy that ben, Beth ended right. up with, but mm-hmm. I think that's just because we were really only seeing things from Al's point of view and from, and it was only just starting out. Whereas. We've seen what Tom's been able to do to help Addison. Addison's gone through a lot of the grieving process already and had already gone through acceptance. And uh, now she's, you know, experiencing it all again because she's going to have to grieve a relationship again, basically, Uh, whether it's Ben or Tom, whatever she ends up choosing, or both. Um, So, no, I I found her quite... I did find the situation quite sympathetic, and I think it's because it was well-written and it was more of a show rather than tell, because in MIA, as fantastic as an episode MIA was, it was all tell, really, because we're only hearing it from Al's perspective, who's already lived through it. So, yeah. So I I actually did have a lot of sympathy for... um, Maybe not so much for Addison, because, yeah, she could have waited and she could have... um, put more effort into the search and everything but i can sympathize with the situation at least tom i didn't mind tom at all i I like the character of tom i think the writers uh the writer did good uh having everyone like give their um show their affection for tom everybody at uh, Mm -hmm. hq you know and i kind of went along with that i have no problem with tom at all um and part of me wondered like you know Addison, yes, she's in love with this new guy, but she never really fell out of love with Ben. And, you know, why, when she's presented with the situation of finally being back with Ben, but not really, but kind of being back with Ben, she still chose Tom. I don't know. It it felt to me like, you know, like in a lot of relationships. Love the one you're with. At least some of my, my relationships, I can say that Usually there's one person that likes the other person better. And mm-hmm. it just seems like Ben likes Addison more than Addison like Ben is the impression I got. I think, well, my head counted for this episode. Addison, even though Ben is not dead, he's still effectively a ghost mm-hmm. for her. Like they, there, there is no guarantee that there will ever that he'll never get home. You know, I mean, of course they're going to keep trying, but, you know, you could argue that their best shot 
like was the thing that they did at the end of last season, and he just kind of winked in and winked out again. So, and I'm you know I'm not gonna say that she's wrong for moving on or that if she'd be wrong for for holding out hope, but I get it. I I can understand why um, she would want to, you know, hold on to something real, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. And she says she's got to live her life. That's the thing. She can't be tethered to, like you said, a ghost, because then essentially she's tethered to um, some other plane of existence, and she's got to live in the real world. My fear is that uh, he's a bad guy, that that Tom is like, you know, just a government plant there to... You know, just kind of keep an eye on Addison and the team in case the project starts up again. He's like their mole. That would be infuriating to me. (laughs) (laughs) Like, at the very least, disappointing. And it doesn't, like, it doesn't matter how good it's written, how well it's written, or how well it's acted. Like, there's no way to pull that off that's not going to feel cheap and manipulative. Like just make make it be a genuinely good guy, a good guy, and make it be a real choice. I think he's probably a good guy because something that jumped out at me in the the last episode was that Ian didn't show up until Ben had actually completed the leap and completed the mission and uh, got the managed to save all the military people. So I actually think that in Ben doing that action, that's what enabled Tom to get involved in um, Addison's life, I guess, um, because there seems to be some sort of a military connection there, uh, and also helps to get the project going again. So I I somehow think it's all connected, like he's laying the the track for the train to run on with each leap. I'll be interested to see how things do progress, but I have a feeling that it's connected, and I think that Without Tom there, they wouldn't be able to get the project running and to help, you know, Ben to complete his leaps. At least that's the interpretation that I'm getting. I haven't actually made the, found the missing link yet, but I do think it's there. That's a good thought, John, because he's on like a texting basis with the head of the FBI. So there, yeah. there's a lot more to his backstory than we've seen so far, I think. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that he is as he seems. Because, like you said, like 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 everyone on the team is 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 all like uh, Team Tom. So mm-hmm. I, I hope that I hope that that's deserved. Yeah. And speaking of backstories, like the one that's currently on my back, um, if you want to see <laughs> if you want to see any more, you've got to subscribe to my OnlyFans, OnlyFans dot com slash Canpakes, who are also our sponsor for today's episode. Uh, so. Um, yeah, OnlyFans.com slash Campakes uh, and also QuantumLeapPodcast.com slash Campakes. They've got some great mm-hmm. deals there at the moment. Have we got any interviews for today, Elby? And now we're going to that very special interview with Christina Castro, editor of Quantum Leap. Ooh. Welcome back to the Quantum Leap Podcast. I'm Alby, and I am so excited to have with us this week, Christina Castro. She is an editor for Quantum Leap. You might know her in a, from such episodes as SOS and this week's episode, Ben and Teller. So I'm very excited to talk to you, Christina. How are you doing? Hi. Thank you for having me, Alby. I, 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 it's, it's a pleasure. I really, it really is. Uh, we, we love everybody involved in Quantum Leap and everybody that does it. And, uh, me being an editor, I'm a professional editor, professional editor, uh, you know, a much, much smaller scale. I get paid to edit podcasts and YouTube videos, (laughs) but you know, I have some idea of what you do. So I'm excited and a fan of of your work. Very cool. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, editing is editing. I think no matter, no matter where you do it. So (laughs) is it always arduous. Is it, is always time consuming. I I don't think people (laughs) realize how much time it takes to edit anything. I think, I think that's right. And I also, um, people don't realize how repetitive of a task it is. Um, So my loved ones are always like, what are you possibly listening to repeating the same 
thing over and over and over again. I just drive everybody batty, but uh, it's fun for me. So uh, I know how I got started in editing it, just uh, making my own podcast. And when you're, when you're a podcaster, there's no money in it. So you just, you learn to do everything yeah. yourself. So pretty much I earned my 10,000 hours before I started getting paid for it, you know, working on my own stuff. How did you get started in like post-production and, and, and editing specifically? Yeah, I took um, the expensive way. I went to film school. Um, so uh, yeah, right out of high school, I went to film school. I did an accelerated program, um, got my bachelor's in three years, um, and then immediately started struggling like uh, everybody else and just, you know, took whatever uh, work I could get uh, until I could eventually move down to LA. Um, I'm from Ventura County, so I was up there. Um, and yeah, through some wild twist of fate, I ended up here. So I'm very, I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, uh, I was checking out your website and your IMDb and I was noticing <laughs> I have seen a lot of things you've edited because I'm one of those uh, oh, cool. like film nerds that uh, can't wait okay. for the movie to be over when I have a Blu-ray or DVD and I just want to oh, get to the, the features the and stuff. stuff. Yeah. yeah. And I recognize a lot of the things you edited. Uh, what's it like uh, cool. doing that kind of work? That actually was uh, very cool. I did that. That was kind of my, how I met um, my contacts and to being able to switch from that type of work to scripted television. Um, so yeah, I, it was, it was actually really cool as, you know, obviously a film fan myself to be able to, to watch all of the behind the scenes. What, so what I did was behind the scenes, uh, EPK, uh, DVD special features, marketing material, uh, creative content is what we call it. And, um, yeah, it was just a really great gateway to watch how professional filmmaking is done and, you know, to learn like how stories are made, you know, because during that time we were, we were really fortunate and I say like, it doesn't exist anymore. It still exists. Those people are still there doing great work. Um, but, uh, it was, you know, they trusted us with full feature length movies that were in the editorial process at the time. So um, we got to see how, I mean, it, it depends on what your interests are, right? But I got to see how the edits changed throughout, right? As I was updating my pieces, marketing pieces for the internet and, and TV and stuff. So it was really actually very exciting and, and very cool to watch that stuff. And now to be on the other side of it is, is just like so special to me. Um, are, are you a nerd like me? Do you, do you, do you like, uh, get excited when you see all these like famous people that you're editing, like David Tennant or Sigourney Weaver? Yeah, it was, uh, actually I am a huge Doctor Who fan, uh, and David Tennant is my doctor. So that was really, really cool. I didn't get to meet him obviously, but, right. um, as an editor, and I'm sure you can relate to this, mm -hmm. you, you feel like, you know, the people that you're watching in like mm -hmm. a totally non creepy, maybe to some <laughs> people creepy way. Yeah. Um, and so it's really cool spending time with them, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I got to, I got to cut, uh, David Tennant. I got to cut Johnny Depp a few times. Oh, wow. and yeah, it was lots of Disney stuff. Uh, it was a lot mm -hmm. of fun. That job was a lot of fun. Very a lot of work, fun. but a lot of fun. <laughs> a lot of work. <laughs> Billy Crystal, all kinds of people. Uh, yeah, really, Billy Crystal, really cool. John Goodman. Yeah, yeah. yeah very I, cool stuff. Do you get surprised uh, with those kind of things, like when when you're editing those? Because I know with my job, like you know, like one night I might edit Lavar Burton, another night Terry Crews for something on different podcasts or something. And I'm just sure. oh, that's who I get to edit tonight. Do you get surprised by it, or with your work? Yes. Uh, is it more of like um, you kind of know what project you're going into and who you're going to be cutting? Both. Yeah, so both. So, um, like going into this show, we, unless we're looking at the call sheets and looking very closely, paying very close attention, um, the guest roles, et cetera, um, can be a surprise to us. So, um, we've got some really great guest roles coming up this season. Um, and last season, we got to do 
uh, SOS, which had mm. Superman in it, which was just like, just the coolest thing. Everybody was so excited to see him on our show and he did such a great job. And it was, it was really, it was really a pleasure. It's really a pleasure getting to watch all these different um, actors, you know, work and see their process. Great, great action packed episode too. Very good. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Uh, how did you make the jump from uh, doing like featurettes and different things like that to uh, television, like full episodes? Yeah. Um, so that job that I had, you know, you just, you make contacts, you know, you're in it long enough and you meet people, you know, so you make friends, you meet people through work, you meet people through school. Um, and I just started telling people what I wanted to do. I wasn't, necessarily unhappy with what I was doing. Um, but I felt like I had a dream, right? Or goals to at least try to attain, right? And achieve. So I just started telling people. Um, and I eventually parted ways with that company, got into reality television for a little while where I was editing that. Um, and I got to sort of bypass the assistant editor role in that world. Um, and then one day I, I got a phone call from a friend who her, you know, I told her what I wanted to do eventually. And she knew people and she was on a show and they needed to fill a slot. And I, I showed up and finished out the show for them and then just kept on, you know, getting hired for other shows. So, um, yeah, that's how it worked out for me. I feel like uh, just it's it can be luck. It could be contacts. It could be, you know, it's always involves hard work and tenacity, but <laughs> it's, it's a lot of hard work. And, and you know, it's what's weird. It's it's a job that you have that if you do your job correctly, no one thinks about it the whole time. Exactly. Yeah. So what's that that's, like? That's the goal, right? They call us. um an invisible art, visible artists, mm -hmm. right? Um, and right, if we do our job properly, then you won't ever be able to tell, right? The goal is to keep you immersed in the story um, and and guide you through guide you through the storyline, I guess, essentially, right? Make it translate it so that it makes sense for the audience. Um, so, you know, <laughs> um, our, our, our listeners, they might not know like the different positions in the editing department. When we see the credits roll by at the end or you get a credit up front at the beginning, which is awesome. Uh, but like there's yeah. assistant editors, there's, you know, special effects editors, there's all these different editors. Right. Uh, yeah. do you all work together and, and who does what, who's responsible for what? Yeah. So I'm, uh, what is known as a picture editor. Um, and then, yeah, you're right. We also have music editors, sound editors, um, you know, just dialogue editors, <laughs> all this ADR, everything. Right. Um, and we do. Yeah, we do work together. So um, the role of a picture editor is to we receive the footage uh, while they're filming. So the next the day after day one really is when we start for real. Um, and we just start getting whatever footage from the scene that they shot the previous day. Um, and we know because we're, we're on the schedule and we know exactly what they're shooting and when. Um, and then we just assemble it according to the script. Um, and we adhere pretty closely to the script. That's called an editor's cut, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of our first pass. And that, that is really to just show the show the way that it was intended originally to be shown. So, um, and that's what we present to the director. And then we will include sound effects, music. Those, those are all choices that, that me and um, my assistant editor, Jackie, um, those are all decisions that we make together. And um, it sort of informs what the music and the sound uh, uh, design will be uh, during the final product. So our, our job really as editors and assistant editors are to make make an episode that 
nobody has to use their imagination anymore, right? Like it's, it's, it's viewable and watchable and, and sounds as close to, we don't do as good of a job, <laughs> right? Mm. Uh, we are, we're limited in, in some of our, our capabilities with our editing software. And that's why we have those other professionals. And on this show our just our music team and our sound team are just so, so excellent. I just, it's my favorite day going to playback and, and, and watching it, you know, um, it's, it's really a lot of fun. They're really great. Really great. There's some, some good sound work in there. Uh, so, uh, as I understand it, you have a editor's cut, a director's cut, and maybe a producer's or final cut. Are those the same thing? How, what's the whole process? How many different cuts before it airs? There are uh, many, <laughs> <laughs> very, very, very many. Um, my, my mentor likes to tell me we are in the notes business. Hmm. So we'll do an editor's cut, um, which is, which will last the duration of the shoot, which on our show is typically about eight days, give or take, plus okay. a few days, give or take. And then, um, that goes to the director. Um, they're given their allotment of days, four days or so. That goes to the producers. They take as much time as they need, really, you know, the schedule permitting. And then it'll go to the studio network. Um, and then, it, it it goes out just dozens of times before <laughs> anything airs on TV. Yeah. And then everybody, you know, sort of gives their ideas and, and collaborates on how to make it better. Oh, good. A lot of notes. Yeah. I, I get a lot of notes as well. So I know what you're talking about. It's so nice when you don't get that many though. Right. You know, I, it depends. I've definitely yeah. had, I've, I've been on both sides of it. Right. We all have like a, mm -hmm. The, it's always great when you hear no notes, right? But then it's like, are you sure? <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe somebody else wants to contribute something to mm -hmm. this. Um, and so, yeah, there will be, it, it really depends on um, what state the script is in mm -hmm. um, and just any issues uh, that they might have had during production. You know, sometimes things don't go as planned and you sort of have to adapt and and work around it. So uh, sometimes, you know, there is no time and we get one or two takes and those are the choices that we have to choose from. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, speaking with Dean, he was saying that, some, you know, some episodes come in long uh, on the first cut uh, and, you know, they got to cut what, nine, 10 minutes out. I think I've heard in some cases mm -hmm. uh, when you're, when you're putting the show together and you're following the script, I think is what you said pretty much. Um, are you, yeah. are you like in the back of your head, are you thinking you got to get under a certain amount or are you just trying to get as good as a story as possible to start with, to give the director and producer room to cut what they think they should cut? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, both we, um, so yeah, like I said, we, we try to adhere to the script as best as possible. Um, our jobs as editors are to present the script. And, you know, directors will will make choices that we have either spoken about before they're in the script or just by watching the footage are very obvious that they'll want in there. So, yeah, our, our, our editors cut are typically for episode two. It was quite a bit over. It was about 11 minutes over oh, wow. time. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, not something I'm very proud to admit, mm -hmm. but it's <laughs> it is what it is. And yeah, together we just. We took the time out and um, I think it plays really well. I think we were able to keep the tension and actually it, it plays a lot better, you know, with more pace to it. Mm -hmm. Is uh, like the footage that you use and stuff like preserved. So maybe one day if they were to do like say director's cut or editor's cut releases, the, the material is still there. Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, so we find, we finalize the final cut. Um, but that footage, especially nowadays, everything's digital. So we back everything up on hard drives, LTO tape. And if at any point we need to restore it, we can. And we archive all of our old versions and we archive all of our Avid projects and stuff. So mm -hmm. all it would really take would be a crew, a post crew to come in and plug in the hard drive, turn over the director's cut sequence and send it to online i mean it would be it's work right they'd have yeah, to they'd have to color it, it again mix it and color it and, and all that stuff right they can't just take the original and sometimes if it's close enough to the original you can sort of get away with slotting in what's new um i digress so yeah it, yeah. it does exist 
And um, I've heard some good things have been cut for time. Oh so. yeah. Yeah. It's, it's always a challenge. It It is really just like, you don't want to let, leave anything on the, you know, on the floor, as they say. Um, and just sort of, you know, you, you see something good and you, you laugh at it or you're touched by it. You want everybody else to experience it too. Um, so it is hard letting go of some stuff and it's, that's, it's, it's probably one of the biggest challenges I would say is just, is, is letting go of it and just trying to make the most like succinct, you know, story that you can. Hmm. Cool, cool. Uh, I, I want to nerd out a little bit. I want to ask you some technical yeah. questions that I'm just curious about. Oh, like, gosh. we've seen some behind the scenes footage, or you know, okay. clips on Instagram and stuff. What kind of what kind of files are you working with? Uh, are you editing in 4K, or or are you just you know you editing like um, what proxy so, files? Yeah, we're editing proxy files. Uh, so at when when so when they film the show, they uh, di will upload it um, or send a hard drive. It used to be to Mm -hmm. the lab, such as, I don't know, Technicolor or somebody, and they will uh, apply the LUTs and sync it with the audio and upload it to a server where um, it just sort of magically appears uh, on my computer. It doesn't really, it it involves Mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, behind the scenes technical work by Jackie, but uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, it just, it just appears and, and Avid, uh, works on MXF file format, so it is technically a proxy file, and so we're we're running it like I don't know the DNX thirty six. So are you work, working mostly at home? Yeah, uh, we do have offices at Universal, um, and we do still have the flexibility to to work from home. Um, so I did all, pretty much all of season two, what we've done so far from in here. Um, and then I live very nearby universal, so I can sort of, you know, pop in as needed or as wanted, right. That it's our, uh, post-production department is unique in that we are located on the, not on the stage, but on the the lot where they, they shoot the show. So, um, we're very close proximity. Usually they shoot in somewhere else, Canada or Chicago or somewhere um, and post-production is here, but this show they shoot on the lot for the most part and locally. And then, uh, so yeah, we get to visit set and stuff, which is oh wow, so fun. Yeah. It's super cool to get to watch them do that stuff. Everyone I've spoken to from Quantum Leap, they seem to be very kind and supportive of each other. Do you get that feeling working with this team? Yes, it really is. Um, it really is. We all feel, I think, very fortunate uh, in that we all kind of nurture each other. It's it's a very. I think all of TV is. It's all very collaborative, right? But it the, on the show, I think it's just it's so big and it can get complicated at times. And so it's really important to to team up and make sure that we're all making the same show, right? Because it's so easy to just sort of sit in your little dark room and forget about the world and only focus on the task at hand. And, um, it's, it's great to put your mark on something, but also, you know, we all want to make the same show. So, um, we all, we all, you know, communicate outside of work. We, we're, we're just, we're all great friends. We all support each other. And it's really a really fun, um, post-production team, but also the production, the production people are really cool too. That's so awesome. Um, uh, you, you, uh, you edited SOS. I see the poster behind you. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those are always fun. Um, and, uh, of course you edited this week's episode that everybody just watched Ben and Teller. Well, ben and Teller. You're editing the same show quantum leap for those two episodes, but they're two very different episodes. Cause one's like an action yeah. thriller and one's more of an intimate, like, um, people episode inside of a bank there's some action there's some action but what are some of the differences but you want to keep the show the same show but it's also different genre almost different period also yeah does that affect that's what it's a very challenge that's what makes this show um it presents an an, a unique challenge which is every episode is, is in its own time era um and genre 
So we are introducing new characters every week. Um, we have to make sure the audience is invested in those characters, right, in order for the episode to work. Um, but you're right, you know, like um, each episode is almost like a bottle episode in a way, um, which makes it a lot of fun, right? Like you get to play with different genres, like each each new episode that you that you get to work on, um, but also, you know, it's a very it's a very tight schedule, so <laughs> you have to make decisions very quickly. Mm, very cool. Uh, another random question I had, uh, you know, we've we've been very fortunate here at the Quantum Leap Podcast to see very early cuts of episodes, uh, like with stock footage and different things, temporary special yeah. effects, maybe or just a card that might say something right. going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, when you're editing, are you like in charge of finding stock shots that might not be the final ones, but one that works for the edit at the time? Or is that like your assistant or how does that work? Yeah, um, I'm I'm not in charge of it, per se. I give the, the assistant or our production or post-production coordinator or uh, post PA, you know, Gabby and Esmeralda. Um, I sort of will say, you know, it's either scripted or we need. And most of the time they're 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 way ahead of it then way more ahead of it than I am. They're already working on it. And like, you know, so I'll, I'll get to it. It's like, Oh yeah, we need a, you know, a skyline shot, whatever. We don't use a whole lot of stock in this show, but you know, sometimes mm-hmm. we do. Um, and they're already, they're already finding it, you know? <laughs> Very cool. So yeah, I, we have a team of people. And then we also have somebody on the studio side who um, has stock that we, that we can use from the universal library and stuff. So. Very cool. Uh, as an editor, do sometimes you get an idea that you maybe think, oh, this would make that great, but I don't have it and maybe communicate that to a producer or a director or something, or is it too late? Um, most of the, I'm going to say, uh, sometimes it is too late, but if it depends on where we are in the shooting schedule, um, mm-hmm. say for instance, they didn't have time on the day to get an insert, right. And it's integral to the storyline. They'll, they'll go and pick it up. Right. And, uh, mm-hmm. so, so yeah. So during the editor's cut, if we don't, we, it's very rare that we have every piece of footage that we're going to use, um, at the very start of the process. Sometimes, you know, we wait until the very, very end to, to get something cleared and slotted it and send it out the door. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, yeah, that part's kind of fun. How many versions do you go through? Like when you're naming your final, is it like final version two, final, really? Oh, final? Yeah. How, how does that work? We, no, no, no. <laughs> there's a, there's a naming structure that okay. we, that we adhere to. Every show has kind of its own unique naming structure, but it's pretty much like if we're in the editor's cut, this is editor's cut, you know, work in progress. And, um, you know, then it goes out, that's the editor's cut, you know, and then the director's cut, and then we'll do director's cut one, two, three, whatever, however many versions they do, et cetera. So uh, internally, yeah, we name it, but there's, <laughs> for each episode from the very start, I mean, I've got probably, geez, 10, 20 sequences, you know, and you're always duplicating because anytime you want to try something new, you know, it's at least for me, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty non-committal until I have to be. So, um, <laughs> you know, you make different versions and you, you test them out and see which ones work. You know, you, you, you ask your assistant, Hey, can you watch this or one of the other, other editors? And, um, yeah, that's sort of how we work together. Oh, that's cool. Other editors and uh, you get a net, other pair of eyes on it. Cause sometimes you get too close to it, right? All the time. I would say, mm-hmm. yeah, it's very easy to, to sort of dig into it and just you're, you're, you know, this close to it. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we bounce it off each other. And another way that we work together is the leap scenes. Um, so the leap scene for, I don't think episode two has a leap, has a leap scene. At, scene at no, the I don't think so. No. Yeah, it doesn't. It used to. Um, okay. And so what we'll get that scene from the editor who, cut that scene and in our case it was Piper and um uh Martin usually will adjust it how he wants it and then that will go back to 
the editor whose episode it originated in, but since it airs after mine, you know, um, they sort of, so that, that sort of helps us maintain consistency. Um, and also a really great way for us to collaborate with each other and see what each other are doing. Um, steal ideas, maybe. <laughs> How does that work? Like, I, I know there's probably, you, you're, what's the union like for, uh, say, uh, television editors? Is it, and like, the, the, is there things to where like, uh, yes, you worked on a part of an episode, but you're not credited for it, but do you still get paid for it? Like little things like that, that leap in, leap outs that might not be uh, from that episode, you know, little, little parts. Uh, yeah, I don't think, I think that there is a rule. Um, and in order for you, I think you have to, don't quote me on this, but I think mm -hmm. you have to do like a certain percentage, 50% of an episode in order to be credited. And then there's, um, there's a process involving paperwork where you, you know, you, you know, you have to ask the original editor, Hey, is it okay if we share credit? They always say yes, because, you know, we're all cool, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's Very the process cool. on that. And uh, with that, with uh, talking about uh, unions and strikes and stuff, how did that affect your livelihood? Like, uh, if they're not filming, right, and writing, you, you don't have as much to edit, right? <laughs> how does that work? I was, that's that's true. I was fortunate um, in that I was on through episode eight, which is going to be our mid-season finale. Um, so I got to stay on through, you know, mid-July, basically. Um, so the writers went on strike. We went on hi production went on hiatus, which was a pre-planned hiatus. Um, and then by the time that was supposed to end, they were on strike. Um, we were able to finish our episodes. You know, um, we were far, far enough along in the process where it didn't really hinder. And then, yeah, I've just been hanging out during the summer. Um, both anxious and not so anxious to get back into it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, it, it definitely has affected all of us really. Um, and everybody on the show is we're we're starting to get the ball rolling again. Um, getting ready to come back for part two of season two. Um, and I think that's just contingent on the SAG negotiation since WGA ratified their deal. Right, so, right. um, that's very good news and mm -hmm. hopefully it looks good for the actors too. And we can all sort of get back to, to making our show. <laughs> awesome. Can't wait. Uh, one thing I was very uh, happy about is that the first three episodes were done and out to the media so early, which means, uh, you know, the post-production is really ahead of the game, which is great instead of like down to the last minute almost. Um, right. Uh, how far ahead are you? Are is uh, eight already edited pretty much? Eight's edited, delivered. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Good, uh, good, yeah, good. it's ready to go. I I think that everything has been everything has been delivered for part one of season two, and um, the the planning we're in the planning process with um, starting up production for part two. That's amazing. That's awesome. So uh, hopefully, I'll get to see some of those soon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Me I've too. Seen up, <laughs> I've seen up to three. I'm looking forward to the the other uh, five of the season. That'll be good. yeah. It's a it's a really special season. Yeah. Um. So let's talk a little bit about Ben and Teller because everybody just watched that. Um. Presumably, if they're watching this, hopefully. Uh, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> if not, remember, please go watch it. <laughs> do you remember anything like uh, any anecdotes or anything from sitting in the editing room and editing uh, Ben and Teller? Anything out of the ben ordinary Teller, or fun? Um, Ben and Teller was a fun episode because it was pretty straightforward. Um, it propels the story forward, but we're also kind of doing our own thing, right. And sort of having fun, you know, um, and it, it was a lot of fun. Um, Ian being the hologram is always just so fun and just watching them work and Ian and Ray bouncing off each other is, is hilarious. And they just sort of ad lib and, and just have a fun time. You know, uh, we had a really great director, Kristen, um, and she did like a really phenomenal job. Um, she's somebody who also comes from an editing background um, and somebody who was 
in my orbit in in Martin's orbit everybody's you know he had worked with her before um and I finally got a chance to work with her and it was seamless and great and she just made like a just a great episode so I felt very comfortable and 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 confident being in her hands that's good yeah they say uh what do they say a, a good director is a good editor because they know the pieces they need to get pretty much I think so. In my in my limited experience, mm-hmm. it 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 really is the sign um, of a good director. I think when they can edit as they're shooting, right, or as they're in pre production, um, their blocking is also very important. And a really great director will give you only what they want you to show, right, um, and sort of weigh your hand almost in in what you use where um and the role of an editor i think is to help bridge what the director wants um and what the showrunners want and and sort of meld them together and 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 make our show uh, there's a am, am I right in understanding there's two different director of photographies on Quantum Leap? I, I know Anna. Uh, Anna, yeah, Anna shot yeah. our show. Right. Yeah. Um, ben and Teller. It's actually funny. I think uh, that the shot where um, Ray Ben sits at Lorena's desk at the first time and he's sort of mm-hmm. getting his bearings and seeing what the date is, etc. The picture of. Um, the mother and the daughter, I think that is actually Anna and her mom. Um, really? I didn't yeah, notice that. I think that's, yeah, a, I I think that's that. a picture of them. Yeah. That's awesome. So that's really that. special. I, I, I just love it when, when we get to participate like that. You know? mm-hmm. Are there, are there some edits, not necessarily on quantum leap, but some that are better than others that maybe you might have the, about the right amount of footage you need. And sometimes you have way too much footage and it's like a nightmare. <laughs> Do you have any of yeah. those stories? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's basically that was basically I don't want to say nightmare. That's that's not <laughs> a, but that was uh a, a, I would say episode one fourteen was uh mm-hmm. I was drowning in footage. Uh Chris Grismer did just he's a beast, man. He just <laughs> he I don't know how he does it, but he shot that episode. It was such a challenge. You know, they were on the USS Montgomery, very mm-hmm. tight, compact spaces, very dark. Um and just just so much footage um good coverage uh, a lot of coverage (laughs) lots of actually yeah um which is impressive given the restraints that he had um so yeah definitely there's times where you're drowning in it and you just don't have the time and you just but your your job is to you know you have to watch everything so yeah you just sort of you know, make it work somehow. Just those are the times where you have to be committal, com- you know, committed to your decisions and um, just trust that, you know, your instincts are right. And if they're not, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. Somebody has your back, right? Like it will, somebody will help you make it better. Um, and that's what's really great on this type of editing versus some editing that I've done in the past with where a lot of it, all of it was written and edited by myself, right? I just get interviews or whatever, and I'm sure you can relate to this and Mm -hmm. you just have to, they say, okay, here's your two hour interview with so-and-so and and we want to show them talking about the stunts. You have a week. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so like you know and then it's just that's it and maybe if you're lucky you get transcripts to the interviews and um you just you you dive right in um and on this type of thing uh everybody has their own role and their own um sense of responsibility to the project and and um so we you know like i say we all got each other's back and and you just gotta stick you gotta stick to it and get through <laughs> Uh, but yeah on the other hand there are some scenes that where you know they're just wham bam Mm -hmm. you know and like like some of the hq scenes they can be challenging Mm -hmm. because there are rules with hq you know we want to make sure that it's always moving and and engaging and you know um but 
I mean, they've, you know, Malcolm and then Lisa and Ernie and everybody, they just, mm-hmm. they have it down. So they make yeah. it easy for us. That's awesome. Uh, so a few more questions before we go. I'm so, um, I want to be more respectful of your time. But I'm just very interested in this whole process. Oh, I got all the time. I got <laughs> all the time in the world. Um, what, so what's your process like? I know I like to like look at all the stuff I have first and then like I kind of pick the pieces out in my mind while I'm watching it and then try to do a rough edit. Is that kind of like your process? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'll be editing in my head as I'm watching the dailies down. Um, so my process will be, I'll get the scene, uh, right. We'll get, I don't know, four or five, six scenes from the previous day, uh, and the corresponding paperwork, um, notes from the the script supervisor, et cetera. And just sort of, you know, assemble the scene, um, as they come to us. And then, um, I typically like to just make my skeleton, right? I'm going to, I'm going to have it, all the dialogue there have maybe shots that I want to use, um, and just toss them in there. And then I will move on because you don't typically have, you don't ever have all day to work on one scene unless it's like sort of like a pinnacle scene where it's got a lot of moving parts and stuff and they, they shoot it over multiple days. Um, and that, you know, you sort of have to dedicate more time to, so you kind of have to move on quickly. Um, and then later is I'll hand it to Jackie. Um, and we have, you know, we have great, uh, and great editorial team, great assistant editors, um, Ian Mayberry, Piper Cruz, me, and then, um, Catherine, Katie and Jackie are our assistant editors. And they really just, you know, she will do her sound work on it. And she's great. Like I can ask her to um, go in and, Hey, I'm having trouble finding the right music. I want it. I just can't, I don't have the time to go through and listen to everything. This is what I want the vibe to be. Um, And then magically she will find it and cut it in. And I don't ever have to worry about it again. Um, uh, So it's, it's kind of a multi-step process. And then once we're far enough along into the shooting schedule, maybe we've got like a day or two left um, is really when your episode starts to take shape. And it's during that time where you start to add music, at least for me, Um, I wait until pretty much the very end to add music. And then I, I let the music help propel the, the pace of the show. If that, if that makes sense, just for, I think for my, my background in marketing, um, it was very music heavy. And so I just sort of, and music is so, so important, I think, to every show. We have a lot of it in ours. So um, it's just about finding the right vibe and going through and just watching it as many times as you have time to. And if you can watch it with, you know, together as a team, um, it's even better. And then you just sort of, you know, it used to be before we started working from home, we would all be working in the office together and you know we could just sit on the couch in the office have a big tv watch it you know as though we're watching it at home and you know make our notes etc but uh not so much anymore so yeah i i wait until kind of the end to sort of start taking my air out and you know and then going in we already know what works and doesn't work for martin and bean right um with some, you know, trial and error. Of course, every every episode is different. Um, so that really helps us sort of uh, inform our decisions and and make them kind of quickly. Are the are the needle drops uh, in in the script, or are you picking them, or is it collaborative, or how does that work? Because there's some expensive songs playing. They got to be expensive. Yeah, they're very good songs. In the, they the first are. Season so far. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, some of them are scripted, uh, and some of them aren't. Um, sometimes. There's not one scripted, but, you know, you get to a point in the episode where you think, man, this would be really, this would benefit from a needle drop. Is there money in the budget? Um, And then we'll go to the the music supervisor and ask them uh, for options and they'll choose what's available to us and, and within our budget and we can whittle it down from there. Um, so if it's added later, usually it's a collaborative process. You know, they'll send us stuff. We'll pre- present options to Martin, um, and then he'll choose, right? Um, 
So yeah, there were, there have been some, some needle drops that I've, I've tried to get in there and they just, <laughs> they won't stick, but <laughs> maybe one day, maybe one day, uh, maybe so, one day. Yeah. So people have seen uh, SOS and they've seen uh, Ben and Teller. You got a couple more episodes coming in this first part of season two without any spoilers. Right. Can you just say something about them? Oh man, they're so big. Like, uh, yeah, big, <laughs> good, exciting, something to look forward to. Yes. Uh, ben goes to some really cool places. Um, he, he leaves the country uh, yeah. and we meet some uh, really interesting characters that, that really challenge um, Ben and Addie specifically. Um, and yeah, we get to see just witch hunts and 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 uh egypt and the la riots and we just go everywhere and it's just i'm really excited for part two season of season two because i can't wait to see like i mean season or episode eight they they shot in egypt and that was just so cool for me uh personally and just getting to watch it and that presented its own challenges but the final product is really fun I think really special. Do you, um, I, I know you're seeing everything as it's coming in unedited. So it's much different than what we see, but uh, are, are you still getting like sucked into the story sometimes? All the time. Yeah. Especially when uh, it's, it's yeah. Especially when it's something that um, we have a lot of emotion in this mm -hmm. show. Um, they mm -hmm. like That's to really, part lean on the yeah the like the character connections with our main cast and also our guest casts um so that's always when we were doing 14 you know it was such a special storyline having Addie with her dad you know and her dad being Brandon was just extra cool on top of that um so watching Addie sort of internally navigate that like why was he so hard on me when he's like really just this big softy you know and um watching ben support her through it um and just yeah i i i i love i agree with you in that the guest roles are are kind of the fun part right because you get to introduce new characters and 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 play with new genres and concepts you know depending on what what's going on with them so um, episode two was fun because our challenge there was um, since it's it's not a grand or episode, it kind of pumps the brake a little bit coming out of episode one, um, was to maintain the tension throughout, you know, while also balancing that that sort of gut wrenching moment, right, that comes on comes in at the end where um, can I can I say? They've seen it, right? So mm -hmm. where, uh, you know, Ben just really only has to look at Addie and mm -hmm. he knows. like Heartbreaking, heartbreaking, oh, oh man. heartbreaking. You know? I cry. And now where, as an audience, yeah, like me too. And yeah. as an audience, like, where do you, um, it just, we all ship Batty mm -hmm. on our show mm -hmm. is what we call them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so seeing them challenged is, is challenging for us too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. job job well done <laughs> thank you thank you and i didn't you know that part did not change um they just caitlin and ray are they just they knew what to do Kristen knew what to do um i i cut it together and that is what aired so <laughs> it um really was perfect i think from from you know, the word action, I think. So uh, it's it's going to be really interesting to see how Ben and Addy sort of navigate that uh, in the future. Uh, one thing I wonder is, um, do you save the the bloopers? Is there going to be blooper gag reels down the line? And oh, how man. do you do that? When, do, is it something that makes you laugh? Yes, or? all the time. Uh, Jackie gets to see them more often than me because um, Jackie's job is to process the dailies um and sort of what we what we call mark them up for the editor um so she will uh 
she will make a notation whenever they say action is very boring and technical, I think for somebody who's not interested, but um, so she sees every minute of footage and I see, you know, I will scrub past, you know, action and cut, but for the most part, I see the action and the cut. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. um, there is in every project, there is a bin that we save of bloopers and, Anytime we come across them, we subclip them, toss them in there, and at the end of the season, Universal gets them. You know, as part of as part of our um, our archiving duties. So, hopefully, there will be a physical release, and and everybody gets to see that stuff because, man, Mason and they're just <laughs> Mason and Ray and even Ernie. I mean, they're just. And Rissa, they're just all of them are just they have so much fun and it's really fun watching them just vibe on set, you know, because we get to see, you know, when they're not working, so to speak, they're working, but when they're not acting and. Um, yeah, they're all just hilarious, especially Mason. Uh, everybody loves them and their their ad libs and just their whole vibe and personality. Um. Do you, do you still watch the episodes when they air? Uh, even oh, yeah. though you see them in time? Yeah. Is that yeah, your time to relax yeah. and enjoy? Or are you still like looking no. at your work, <laughs> making sure everything? Still, and... You know, it's both. I, I, I like to watch it on the TV any opportunity I get as uh, part of the process. It really helps um, when you detach from and leave the environment of like the edit room. Um, and actually like sit on the couch and watch it as a viewer. It changes your perspective and you can, you can see it sort of more in line with how the audience might see it. Um, and that's really, really helpful. But also I like to watch them after the air, after they air and just sort of like, almost like, uh, you're watching like, a like your own sports game, right. Mm -hmm. And trying to like improve your game. Right. So I, I like to watch and just sort of see what made that episode special, right? Like, man, that director really was able to nail this, that, and the other thing. And look at how beautifully that turned out on screen. Um, and then also like, you know, oh man, I wish that I hadn't, I wish that I had cut just a hair later, or I wish that that line was on camera, stuff like that. And you're just always, I feel like the work is never done. You always want, you're always going to, unless they take it away from me, I'm always going to be whittling away at it. And um, I think that's, that's a big part of the process for a lot of people and um, learning to let it go and enjoy it for what it is and move on to the next thing is, is, is a challenge in itself, but also really cool. You know, it's, it's such a cool job to like participate in making something that people love, you know? Um, and this show is unique to me and my career in that, like it, along with, another one other show maybe that I've I've worked on has a big fan base and um people really care about it and there's an internet presence of fans and we get to see the feedback and um we're listening <laughs> <laughs> very cool Christina Castro thank you so much for joining me on thank you so much Podcast. this was so cool I was so cool for me uh you're you you do what I want to do one day, so that's very cool that I got. Well, I hope I hope you I hope you can. It really is um it really is a special thing, and I feel very fortunate. Um, especially you know we're we're so lucky to to work on. It's such a fun show. It's very challenging in a lot of ways. It's massive, but um, man, when you get that footage, you know, and like you see the super cool shot of the 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 ship and the cannons are not really going off but in the final one they're going off yeah, and you know yeah. we make it seem like they are and it's just mm -hmm. it's a dream come true and it really is it, i can't wait to get back to it
Wow, that was a great interview with Christina Castro. It was so cool just nerding out and talking about editing stuff. Uh, great, great person, great guest. So much stuff that I learned and I wanted to know about, and she answered everything. It was like the dream interview, uh, an editor interviewing an editor. It was great. So thank you so much, Christina, for being on the show. Uh, so let's let's talk about a little bit more about the actual leap. I, I thought that the uh, leap in this episode, uh, being part of a like a hostage in a bank robbery, uh, w- was interesting. It felt like a classic episode of Quantum Leap to me. It really gave me that feeling, and I really appreciated it. And I I did like more back at the project and everybody because it's an ensemble cast, and I love everybody at HQ also. But the Ben story, it was it was really good. And then Ian being the hologram, I enjoyed the heck out of Ian being the hologram. Yeah. I thought they did really great at it, just filling in last minute. And so, what do you think about the actual leap? I agree with you. It's it's, it's pretty classic leap, and and like I said, it's it's. Um... You know, it's this effectively this these three or four people, you know, who are like really like the the core of the action. Um, I like the way Ben played the woman that he leapt into. Um, you know, she, <laughs> you know, very very sedate, very um, calm throughout it, very well spoken. Um, like I could get, like, I could see, I could imagine this woman saying the things that, that Ben was saying. Um, and you know, the, the Pilates where he breaks through the wall at the end was great. It does. It does really feel like, you know, an old person's not going to put up with that kind of shit. They're just like, all right, yeah. let's just sort this out. I don't care yeah. if you take the money, just leave me alone. This is not I, my I don't, I don't have that much time left. Don't, don't, you know, don't waste my time. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the older yeah, the so character, I, the better. Uh, I have some old friends and uh, they don't care if today's yeah. your last day. They're fine with that. I, I was in a I was working in a restaurant when there was a robbery and we had an older person running the front and the guy had a gun uh, in, in the manager's face and was yelling at him. And he's like, calm down. Be nice. I'm going to get you your money. You need to calm down. Put the gun down. Hold on. Hmm. I, I can't gotta, get you the it, money if I'm dead. Right. And this this guy was, this guy was from New York and he's an old guy from New York and he actually finished cashing out the person that he was working on before he opened the register and like said, have a nice day. Would you like some pies? Uh, And while the guy's pointing a gun at him and then gave him the money, but you know, yeah, those, those kind of situations happen. Uh, I I just found that funny. I, I, I like the relationship between Rebecca and, Ben's uh, leapy or Ben actually the relationship between Rebecca and Ben. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, look, I thought it was a perfectly fine story for the main leap. It was relatively simple, but I think because there was that much going on at the project as well. And also the overarching stuff with Addison and Ben hanging over, I think they needed to have a more simple storyline there to, you know, not overload everyone who's watching. Uh, oh, that's a good I, point. Yeah, I did like the, I did like the camaraderie between Ben and what's her name, um, Rebecca. Sorry, I've forgotten what the woman. Rebecca. Name, thank you. Yeah, um, and I also thought it was a, a nice um, sort of familial tie between um, Rebecca and her brother, and you know, it, all families have problems, and it is very easy. I shouldn't say it's very easy, but it's you do see people kind of getting kicked out of families or, you know, families eroding and people not talking because of certain decisions like the kid going down a few of the wrong paths. But uh, it it was good to see that, you know, they still have each other's back at the end. And yeah, because because the brother shot the the main robber to try and save Mm -hmm. the sister and the sister was willing to take the take the fall for it so blood can be thicker than water not always but it was good to see on screen i guess why do you think sean would have went to rebecca's bank the the bank of tucson uh to rob it and not just a random other bank because i i think he they would be more likely to get caught eventually because they could be identified because the one of the bank tellers is the sibling of one of the robbers you know it just seems dumb. I guess criminals are dumb to begin with, but it just seems extra dumb to me. I'm 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 headcanoning this uh that they're in a 
kind of a smaller town, smaller city, and that's the big bank. Because he's like, you know, it's the it's the payday or whatever. Like this is like there should be a big uh, hall today. So like, yeah. this, like this is it this seems is, like everyone goes the there for, for the area. Yeah. yeah. So I I was I was just chalking it up to that. That's just the biggest bank around. Either the criminals are just incredibly stupid, <laughs> or maybe they thought that having a relative actually working there, um, she might be more inclined to help them. Mm-hmm. I was surprised there wasn't a gasp for, from everyone, you know, on the floor trying not to get killed when uh, Sean and Rebecca talked about being brother and sister. Like, you know, like I was expecting a gasp. I don't know. I, I got... Maybe everyone was more worried about staying alive than... Yeah about all the other <laughs> drama going the drama <laughs> i don't i don't know and i don't know if they were near enough to hear because they were all kind of sitting oh, on good the point. floor um mm-hmm. you know like not super far away but maybe not close enough to hear that conversation i thought the main i don't i don't know who played the um the main robber the the, the villain of the piece mm-hmm. but he was i thought he was he was very good he had a nice blend of uh menace and charm uh, I think that was Billy Lush who played Vince. Yeah, I, I, the, the guest cast was great all around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did like the fact that the project was able to help out a little bit as well. Uh, uh, the fact that, you know, obviously this older woman doesn't have all the information like the mm-hmm. combination to the vault or um, or a lot of the other authority that was needed. But it was uh, it was nice to see that, you know, they were able to to get it for them. I really enjoyed seeing uh, Jen <laughs> say to Magic, turn away. I don't want you uh, getting involved when I look this up on the dark web. And yeah, it is a bit freaky that, you know, exactly what she needs is there. It does. I, I won't go on the dark web, but I do uh, <laughs> wonder what is there. You know, I'm sure that all of us are on there with God knows how much of our information. Um, and, I like that yeah. she used dark webbing as a verb. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. Like, yes, Jen is doing more dark webbing. I love this. Uh, that brings up another thing. Magic said, well, I'm glad I'm not a government employee anymore. So let's talk about Magic, about not being a government employee, and also about picking up an anniversary present for someone. Apparently, he's married mm. a Dude, year now. Uh, I have a theory about who yeah. he might have married. I think we all have a theory. Is, is it the same yeah. theory? Let's go with John first. Who's your theory, John? No, John doesn't have a theory. Really? I was going to leave it to okay. the, no, I will, I will leave it to the, you who are uh, far more. You'll leave it to Nostradamus here. <laughs> okay. Hayden, uh, let's say at the same time who we think it is. Three, two, one. Beth. Beth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Beth. Yeah. I hope it's Beth. Yeah. That'd be great. Cause we get to see her again. And I think that's okay. Cause you know, Al's dead. So literally. Yeah. And dead. also so they're, um, you know, they were very close. They, they've probably yeah. been a huge comfort to each other with Al going because obviously, you know, Al's Beth's husband, but also um, Al and Magic were quite close too from what we, we could hear. And um, I think everyone would approve. So, yeah. Yeah, I would love uh, to see I, I you all back. And I would love to see an episode where, you know, uh, Magic goes home and Beth's there and they're hanging out, you know, watching, you know, Housewives of who knows where. That'd be great. Reality shows. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, that was my first go-to thought. Yeah, my, mine too. What do you think about Jen uh, playing poker? I, I liked it. it well, was she was right. And, she was right about yeah. the pocket kings. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love playing okay. poker as well. And I, that, I think that's the same move I would have done. Mm-hmm. What about this yeah. like little bit of a mystery they introduced with uh, Jen talking to Ian about what uh, they did to um, find Ben in the first place. Cause uh, they said uh, some of the truth, but not the whole truth. So mostly a lies from what I'm understanding. So you think this has to do with um, Ian going leaping and going into other people, like in uh, the first episode where they leaped into oh. Shakina, uh, maybe, um, uh, I don't know. Like, where? What do you? Where do you think that's going? What? What Maybe. were your head cannon while you were watching it? I wasn't. I wasn't head cannoning, cannoning at all. I. I dark webbing. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't dark webbing. I was. <laughs> I was starting to. Uh, 
my sphincter began to tighten. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm really, really hoping that it's not like a whole, like another season long mystery box that where we slowly get a thread, you know, every, episode. I'm like, please don't do that. Please don't do that. Like mm. I'm, I'm, I, I would love it if whatever Ian did is revealed, you know, within the next episode or two. And then they can, and then they can move on, and then the show can like progress from that point. That's that's what I hope. But I I really don't like, you know, this team member finds out this thing, and that team member finds out that thing, and then episode nine they compare notes, and oh, I think what's up? I'm like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. So that's that's that would be a that would be a minus for me. All right, I've got a couple of competing theories, so. Nostradamus time. The first theory I have is Sam leapt to help Ian discover um, to help Ian discover where Ben is, and uh, together they came up with some sort of a way to do it. Or uh, the second theory is, which I think is the more li- likely one, um, I think that well, a couple of things. The project is government funded, so they would have basically had no money. Like Ian said, all he'd be able to do is keep Ziggy running like he's looking for like they're looking for aliens. Um, so in order to have, even have the computing power needed to be able to search for Ben, I think they would have needed an awful lot of money. So I think that um, Ian's gone and tried to get in touch with some not so nice people perhaps some competing um agencies to try and privately fund enough in order to at least be able to get the search happening again so i'll be interested to see if uh they come back wanting some sort of a return on their investment or wanting um you know some other tasks to be done as, as a return for that favor um could this be the start of the evil leaping project? You know, if um, the government uh, doesn't keep funding the project, they have to get their funding from somewhere else. And, you know, it's the thing. If things are privatised, all the they care about are their shareholders. So they're going to want some sort of a return for their investment. So, yeah, I think... Uh, I think that there's a bit going to be a bit more bureaucracy and probably a whole lot of Ill- illegality going on based on how um, Ian got the project running again, at least at the beginning. I was wondering, um, like in in the in the quote unquote real world, like in that three years. So, like, imagine you're like you're funding this quantum leap project the first time. Sam goes and he's lost, like immediately. The next time Ben goes, he's lost immediately. And they look for him for two years. And so like, like this is a boondoggle. <laughs> this is not a successful, <laughs> this is not a successful project. It doesn't work. Yeah. And as, I doubt as Diane as McBride's did. still there to fight for them either. Right. <laughs> and so, okay. No, so, no. so they lose Ben. So do, do they train, do they try to send someone else? Like okay, we accept that. Like you know, let's just say Ben is gone. We 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 accept that he, you know, died in the line of duty. So that does that nobody else leaps. I mean, surely. I mean, not to be cold about it, but you know, if you're testing a new rocket or you're testing a new ship or you're testing any kind of new technology, you never want casualties, but it's not unexpected. Like that doesn't mean you like unless it you know unless there's a major catastrophe that blows up a city block or something. Well, there is another thing going on there, and that's the ethical issues. Um, I can give you a good example of, of something real world to demonstrate what I'm talking about. Um, when, whenever any sort of research has to be done with or on human beings, there has to be quite a big ethical um, uh, ethics process that you go through to get the approval. Um, to make sure you're not going to cause harm or at least reduce all the risks. Um, if it's if there is very, very high risk, then the only way that you can actually get any kind of approval is to do it to yourself because ultimately mm-hmm. you're putting yourself at risk. That's why I actually think Sam made the initial leap um, to start with because 
you know, it's too dangerous for anyone else to be used as a guinea pig. So if he's willing to do it himself, fine, but no one else um, would be able to. And the same with Ben. He obviously knew the risks and did it himself. But remember, they were still years away from what they thought would be able to be used to do human testing. Um, we remember that from like the very first couple of episodes of the new series. So mm-hmm. um, I actually think that they wouldn't be allowed to send anyone else because they've shown it's too dangerous already. They've already lost two people essentially. And uh, yeah. They, so then. Even if it's successful, they still think it's probably too dangerous. So does I... that mean that the, the project with Martinez never happens or is it happening Concurrently. Well, I, th- I, I think they would have to get it to the stage where they can assure um, minimal risk, I think is what goes on. Like a real world example, uh, sorry, I did allude to a real world example. It's uh, uh, to do with um, ulcers. And um, it was thought that they were caused by stress, but it's actually mm-hmm. from a particular bacteria. And the way that they were able to prove this was um, the person who had the theory actually in actually uh, infected themselves with the bacteria and caused the ulcers and then found that they were able to be treated with antibiotics. But they huh. would never be able to do that kind of research unless they did it to themselves, if you get what mm-hmm. I mean. So um, so you, you've got a point. Obviously, somewhere down the track, they do send leapers back, but it would I think it would be far enough down the track that they've done the necessary risk minimization. And again, Martinez knew that he was never getting home as well. So it must be another case too of him knowing the risks and doing it to himself too. So, or at least that's a good possibility. Yeah. That is a very good observation, John, because uh, I was thinking while I was watching this and that they closed the government, the Pentagon closed down the leaping project. And I'm thinking the government wouldn't give up on the possibility of time travel because that is the ultimate weapon. So right. maybe they just what you yeah. just said triggered in my mind. Maybe they just shut out, shut down that quantum leap project because if they shut it down completely and mothballed everything, shuttered everything, then Martinez wouldn't have happened, and then it would undo everything that happened. So they must be continuing it in a separate project, which means maybe there's multiple quantum leap projects out there. And maybe that's who Ian's gotten in touch with. Hmm. Well, uh, 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 back to the Ian thing. The I I like. I like the mini mystery, Uh, you know, people problem with the mystery box. The people that have problem with it is when like the episodes rely on not knowing what the mystery is kind of like lost, you know, the rewatchability is not there. Uh, But like with this, it's like a mini mystery where like the first time you're viewing the episodes, the first run through the season, it's a cute little mystery. It gives us an opportunity to theorize, guess, make predictions. Uh, If everything was resolved in, and at the end of every episode, we wouldn't have that. So I like that little bit of fun, but it's also minor enough to where the episode still has rewatchability because uh, the whole the whole episode doesn't hinge on it. If that makes sense. Yeah, I, I don't. I am fine with it as a mini mystery. What what I think would annoy me is if there's like a little tease in every show. Because it is a mini mystery, like it doesn't deserve to be stretched out over eight episodes. That I think that's that's what I'm saying. Like it's, you know, I think I think when I watched I, I watched the episode twice, and I think the first time I was wondering, is it, is this how we get Ziggy, mm. like like, you know, OG Ziggy, <laughs> <laughs> um, like is 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 that like, did Ian? upgrade to a more personality based AI that that you know is more similar to the to the one from the yeah. old series as opposed to just being a very smart computer which was what it seems to be in this series yeah that that uh, uh, that would be worth the wait I don't really have a problem with the mystery element of it. And I didn't even have a problem with the mystery element in the first season, to be honest, because I I think that's how TV is basically structured these days. Mm -hmm. This isn't really the same structure that the original Quantum Leap series was. And I think we have to Mm -hmm. accept that it's never going to be the same. The first episode of this season is probably the closest we're ever going to get to it. And, uh, And I've found that 
personally, my own um, preferences have changed and, you know, people's tastes change over time and I, I like it better as the ensemble now. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's not going to be a problem. Uh, I was always a fan of the mystery. So everybody yeah. complaining about the mystery box, I didn't get it because, you know, I, w- I want a little bit of mystery. I want to not know everything that's going on. I, w- I want to guess. I want to be wrong. And on that off chance I'm right, then you get that satisfaction of wow, I figured out the mystery. You know, I'm Sherlock Holmes over here. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I, enjoy that part. I didn't dislike the mystery in season one. Like, and, and I referenced people being mad at it, but I guess I didn't clarify that I wasn't. Yeah. I didn't really dislike it. Um, I think you were disliking more being drip fed it and not being yeah. able to find clues and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think mystery does a good mystery needs clues. And uh, I think part of the reason why I didn't enjoy, I did enjoy it last time is because I was able to actually figure it out because I was looking hard enough for the clues. But I don't think that the average viewer was really looking for clues. And I also wanted to be, and I I presume that it will be, but I also want it to be like immediately relevant. Like if if there's a, like, I don't want it to just be, um, you know, here's a, here's a, in case you were wondering, here's how, Ian got the thing going, but, but like you said, like if it, if it ties in because uh, like they made some dark deal somewhere, if they did, you know, clearly they did something they weren't supposed to do, but you know, if that, you know, ripples out to affect the characters, to affect Ben, to affect the project, you know, in a substantive way, substantive, substantial, I don't know. Substantive is fun. (laughs) In a big way. (laughs) <laughs> in a big heavy way uh then cool but if it's more trivia just you know that it but it doesn't really end up mattering or something that they feel guilty about but everybody else is no oh, no we get it it's fine then i you know then just tell us just tell us what happened yeah, so maybe maybe Ian is in touch with the other Quantum Leap projects, but it's got to be something that uh, Jen knows about because Jen knew there was a secret and talked to Ian about it. So, Well, Jen know. is the one that gets into all the dark side of things, so she probably knows about all the other Quantum Leap projects if they exist. Um, well, mm-hmm. I suppose there's an evil project somewhere around because from the 2020s they sent Aaliyah and Zoe back, so I would say there's got to be one around somewhere. Um, and yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if, um, even that's the project that they got in touch with. And, uh, what would be kind of cool is, uh, I know that Carolyn Seymour is very, very keen to reprise her role as Zoe if uh, it came up. So it would be keen to, uh, it would be, um, fantastic to see a scene with, uh, Ian making a deal with Zoe, something like that. Yeah. Although I don't know why an evil character like Zoe would want to help them, but maybe they see a way to progress their project further, perhaps. I don't know. John, you mentioned earlier uh, you had a couple uh, bumps with this episode. Uh, could you expand on that? Yeah, it like I said, it wasn't it wasn't the writing or the acting, um, but just visually to me, um, the, there were some choices that I just didn't that didn't work for me. Um, and actually, I'd forgotten that they did this in the first season too, until I saw it in this episode. But the the very extreme close ups on the like extreme facial close ups um, during scenes, I, like just way too close. Like the the face is like eighty percent of the screen, and it's like two characters talking to each other. Um, it's I mean it's a minor thing, but it's just, it's it's just way too way too close for me, and I felt overall the episode was like the colors were kind of washed out like especially like during the leap like in the in the present you know the the hq present um it seemed like the the colors were were fine or at least brighter but everything in the bank especially the 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 agent who was negotiating with them in the van his it was all green it was like the the whole leap back part seemed like they were like in the matrix. It was all, <laughs> it was green and kind of washed out. And it, 
it just it didn't i didn't i didn't like it i didn't like it and i and i it seems like that's often the style of the show so i might just have to suck it up (laughs) but every episode is not like that and it it, it just it didn't especially didn't work for me in this one director of photography for this episode was anna ma marti which we talked to and uh when we talked to her she had mentioned that the producers really like the extreme close-ups uh, so uh, that's probably why we're getting these extreme close-ups. And the, the, the difference in the color. So do you have an interview uh, with her, Albie? <laughs> it was on last season. So I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, and okay. uh, like uh, for me, the yellow in the 1980s made a lot of sense because to me, I got a yellow feel from it. Like everything was kind of yellow. Mm. But if you remember the 1980s, all our light bulbs were yellow. Like right now, our light bulbs no, are white, I, I, but back then they were yellow. So to me, it gave me that '80s vibe. Yeah, and it wasn't. It wasn't horrible. It's not. It's not like it ruined the episode for me, but it did mm-hmm. just kind of. It was a little off-putting, especially like I said, especially in the van with the green. Mm-hmm. The green. Like, why was he in green? Like that. Like. <laughs> the van part know. was funny. Agent Reynolds. Basically, he just everything he said was a lie the whole time. And every time he got caught in a lie, he was like, ooh. He is you know, a he terrible wasn't good hostage at his job. negotiator. Yeah, yeah. He, was just gonna, job he was just going to, you know, dive in, guns blazing. Mm. And like in the original history, how many people ended up dead because of it? Like Shooting at all the gas lines. to save people bank. as a hostage negotiator, not kill everyone. Yeah. Oh, well. Why do you have a, ga- um, why do you have a gas line you- in the bank? Why do you have a gas line well, in the bank? Spo- how are you supposed what, to heat what, it are they the cooking? without the gas? natural gas i don't know i don't know i central heat what where was this something that jumped out at me um when he leapt in and he saw the calendar saying may 1986 that jumped out at me because i'm like oh did he leap in on my birthday but no he was uh about a week off but about a week yeah, off because I, I was born in may 1986 so oh, wow. i think that's the closest that uh a leaper has gotten to my birthday <laughs> One thing I noticed was uh, there was a couple uh, next window signs at the bank, which you, you see at the bank, you know, they go to the next window because that one's closed. But also I thought, uh, you know, since they couldn't find Ben for three years, you know, uh, maybe the last leap was a window to where they could find them. And maybe this was the next window where they could find them. So it might have had more than one meeting was my thought. And maybe nice. they were just like peppering some some of that uh... in there. Albie's burger theory is back. Oh, there's a lot of burger theory so far for this season. Uh, it has to do with helicopters, though. What's what's so? What's the burger theory? Oh, there's uh, usually that, something that mentioned in each episode that connects to the next episode. So in in this episode, there's a helicopter mentioned a lot. Um, I believe in the first episode of this season, there's also mention of a helicopter. And uh, I yeah, think in next helicopter week's preview, safety at the end. Yeah, and then next next mm. episode, I think in the preview we saw that there might be a helicopter. So some helicoptering going on. I don't know. I'll, I'll I'll look more into that when we get further into the season. And by the way, the reason it's called the Burger Theory, John, is because in Genesis, uh, one of the Doctor's names was Burger, and then in Star Crossed, which is the next episode, um, Sam takes Donna's order for a hamburger. So. Yeah, so there's a little connection between each episode. But uh, I, when I asked writers, they were like, what? What are you talking about? So it might have just been something that was like, you know, like in the zeitgeist of the writer's room at the time. And, and it just happened to inspire things in the next episode. I don't know. but And I've never found a hockey puck either. No, it was supposed to be a hockey puck in every episode. I wonder if they got something in this in this series like that. I don't know. Well, uh, now I think we should go to a break. I want to I want to play this commercial. It's uh, for the Kickstarter. Have you heard Deborah Pratt has got a new graphic novel out? It's called Warrior One, and it's uh, the Kickstarter just kickstarted. It's part of the Vision Quest universe, isn't it? Yeah, um, I don't know if it is or not. I I this is what happened. I found out about the Kickstarter. I think uh, five other people had backed it. Like I found out right away. And I just immediately went to, I think I got the signed Warrior $100 uh, backing. So I'm going to get a hard copy of the book and um, signed by Deborah nice. Pratt, but that'll be cool. Uh, I, and then like I do with my Kickstarters, if I really love a writer or an actor or something, I, I'll back it right away and then I'll find out what I just backed pretty much. Um, but uh, 
Yeah. Well, the email that David sent me, it says, uh, Glasshouse Studios head honcho David Campiti is working with Quantum Leap co-creator, writer, producer, director, Deborah Pratt. David scripted Warrior One, a graphic novel set in the world of the Vision Quest series of novels. Glasshouse superstars Will Conrad drew it and Candace Han coloured it. The book is available in softcover, hardcover, and premium slipcased oversized absolute edition and uh, a link to the Kickstarter. So I think I'd better get on that before uh, I can't get on it anymore. <laughs> Yeah, there's also a quantum leap tie-in. If you if you're if you're rich enough, you can get an original quantum leap script uh autographed by Deborah Pratt. That's that's that was uh, too rich for my blood. Wow. But uh I but, but I did the hundred dollar package because you know I want the nice signed Deborah Pratt. Did it say book. which um script? Yes, but I don't remember right now. Mm, <laughs> trying to think. I don't know. So uh, why don't we go to that uh, uh, that uh, Kickstarter video, and we'll be right back. Cool. Hi, my name is Deborah Pratt, co-creator, head writer, and executive producer of the original Quantum Leap series, and now executive producer of Quantum Leap Reboot on NBC and Peacock. I'm here today to introduce you to my epic sci-fi action-adventure graphic novel, Warrior One. Set in the universe of the Vision Quest novel series, it's the story of a possible, not-too-distant future. A hundred years after the great quake changed the world as we know it. The people of Earth survived, unified, and built a great, almost utopian society. They put their genetics into animals, and those alternate species found that their newly awakened humanity allowed them to remember the powers that we forgot, and they began to teach them back to us. We also put our DNA into machines called the Black Guard, and when they became sentient, they looked at our history of greed and violence and decided we were not worthy to be the stewards of Earth. And they began to annihilate us. The tale of Warrior One is centered around a young woman named Jetta A. After witnessing her father's brutal murder and her mother and brother stolen by these once protectorate machines, she quickly understands the extinction of humanity has begun. Jetta must survive, find food and water and shelter, pick up a weapon and learn to kill or be killed. She must build an army, find her family and win back her homeland. And she needs your help. And so do I. In order to bring this amazing story to life, we are asking you to be part of the adventure of Warrior One. We need to raise $44,000 to finish the graphic novel. This includes paying the artists, colorists, and everyone who is bringing their talent and skill to make Warrior One a reality. This graphic novel is only the beginning of what I know will become the next generation of entertainment. I am asking for your support today. We also invite you to keep following us as we create the TV series, Warrior One interactive video game, and more. Warrior One is a portal into the full Vision Quest universe, where with your help, we will build a new world together. Join me and these talented artists as we bring Jetta A and the Warrior One story of courage, self-empowerment, and most of all, hope to a changing world. Remember, when freedom is taken, a warrior must be born. I hope you'll consider being part of this journey. This is only the beginning. Thank you. And we're back. Did you see what else Deborah put out this weekend? She, um, she did a thing about, uh, she actually got Matt Dale's book in. Um, yeah. the new version of uh, Beyond the Mirror Image, and uh, you know, uh, here I don't know if you guys are Hayden, you got it yet, but um, yeah, I've got it. Uh, Deborah Pratt always carries around the original book, or anytime she needs to know something, she goes to Matt Dale's book, and uh, you know, I always thought she was, you know, she's a nice person and being nice to Matt or whatever, but she took her time to like, like extol the 
amazing uh, things that the book has to offer that she got the new book and was so excited on her social media. So I thought that was really cool that Matt Dale got a, a personalized uh, name check on, on, on her Instagram and all yeah. that stuff. Twitter. Well, Deborah wrote the foreword as well mm -hmm. in the book. Oh, she did. Yeah, it was yeah. really good. And look what I just got here. This came a couple mm -hmm. days ago. Volume two. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's volume two. And uh, Serenity's name's in there. My name's in here. Serenity's name's in there. I think my name's in there, too. I don't know. All right. Uh, let's just uh, wrap up and talk about our final thoughts of Ben and Teller. Is there anything else about this episode you'd like to talk about? Uh, you know what? There was. I did appreciate um, in the scene where Ian lets slip that Addison is back at the project. And mm. uh, Ben is like, Oh, is she there? Is she coming? Is she, is she coming in? And he's and he's looking around and he looks like dead in the camera. Mm -hmm. And she's looking on the monitor. She's like, and they're like they they make eye contact even though there's no way they can actually see each other. I I, I really like that. I really like that. So that so I don't I don't mean to like just 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 uh you know diss on the all of the direction for the show. Like but that <laughs> that I thought that scene was was great. Yeah. The one scene that I thought was kind of unnecessary, or the one thing to happen that I thought was unnecessary was when um ian was giving ben the combination to the vault but got pulled out before saying the last digit mm -hmm. uh that was only to add a little bit of drama really they could they didn't need to do that uh true i mean it, i suppose it was a way to you know show rather than tell that you know they're not supposed to be there and that they could get shut down any minute if they get found out but I don't know. I, I just found that unnecessary, but I enjoyed just about everything else. Um, there was very little that I could pick on, less than John, <laughs> anyway. Um, well, now that you mention it, yeah, <laughs> I was. I, I didn't have. I didn't have a problem with like them not getting or him not getting the the last digit of the code, uh, but they did do the thing where he's he's like openly whispering to people who aren't there. And the, the the robber's like right on her shoulder. And he's like, "Oh, Addison, uh, really use your, you know, just yeah. like having." He's right there. He's not. He's like that's not like stage whisper. Yeah, <laughs> yeah having he's said that much... though, I, I do think that Ben is getting better with the double talk, where he mm -hmm. says something with the intention that you know the per the hologram there will interpret it and know what he needs. Um, so yeah. I, I do that, think that was he's the only, that was the only part that. of this episode that yeah. yeah. So it's um, almost like yeah. Ben has an inner monologue that he's saying out loud. Would that be an outer monologue? I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, also, I, I got the feeling. <laughs> yeah. Also, I got the feeling of Ben treating it almost like a video game again. Uh, in the first episode, it seemed like he was treating it like in a video game to where everybody else was an NPC that wouldn't really comprehend or affect him no matter what he said. So he was just, you know, saying different things, you know, uh, my uncle MacGyver, I got to go feed the hogs, different things. And like when he found the medical kit, I don't know if you remember, but there was like this tingle sound, like ring. <laughs> and I was like, I think, is he in a video game? Where, what is that about? I'm not sure well, if that that's made kind of interesting. Error. Maybe, maybe Ben actually is dead, and it's like, or, or maybe not dead, but like in some sort of a coma or something. And uh, he might have been put into the source code. Because, uh, you know, you remember the, the movie Source Code, and that's essentially what happened. It was virtually a Quantum Leap movie, but in mm -hmm. that case, the guy was essentially nearly dead in a coma, but they used mm -hmm. what last little bit of life essence he had to be leapt back into the Source Code to try and figure out what that's went wrong. That's interesting. So, yeah, maybe, maybe you're not far off. It could be some sort of a simulation or a video game. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yes and you. Uh, okay. I like I like the video game thing, um, but Ben did kind of help write this system. He write helped write the software, so maybe he just wrote it in such a way that there are little video game touches, oh. like just for his own amusement. Mm -hmm. So that because it is you know effectively for someone watching, well, then the imaging chamber. It, yeah, yeah, he put in well not necessarily cheat codes, but just like. No, Ian's the one that does the cheat codes, aren't they? <laughs> right, right. Ian does the cheat, Ian, Ian, Ian does the cheat codes. 
Um, but yeah, maybe maybe he did just kind of program it in that if he happens to find a medical kit, it makes a sound like that. If he happens to <laughs> find a green mushroom <laughs> in the woods, you know, yeah, he'll get an extra well, life. <laughs> he has extra health. Yeah, I think we're uh, way off on this one, but it's a fun theory. <laughs> um, but uh, the season separated by uh, Ben maybe leaping back, and you know them going, oh no. You know, and it that's the end. It's a cliffhanger. So maybe everything we're seeing so far this season isn't real yet. We don't know. That's a good theory. I like mm. it. We're making mysteries when there are, where there aren't any. I like it. Sure. We're becoming so. English teachers, putting far more thought into the text than the author did. Well, that's uh, the, the, you know, interpreting art and literature is uh, what we get out of it, not necessarily what the artist put into it, right? So um, let's let's go to... Uh, very final thoughts and your uh, rating uh, one out of five uh, silly objects from the episode. We'll start with Hayden this time, just because uh, you, you rated the last one pretty low, even though you, you said it was good, but you didn't like it. But what about this episode? Well, this one I actually did like, I thought it was very good. Um, obviously a couple of little things they could tweak but uh generally far far better than um what i saw so of the five cards in my poker hand i'm going to give it four kings okay that's good nice john what about you um <clears throat> i didn't i didn't write the last episode that that would have gotten a five out of five for me probably um i, I like this one a little bit less but still liked it so i, I would give it four um Four new grandbaby photos out of five. Mm. I like it. I'm going to say that I did like the first episode of the season, and I really did like this episode of the season. It, it gave me the both of the things that I wanted, which was more of a quantum leapy feel uh, with the leap, and also it gave me more of the people back at HQ, uh, because I, I love all those characters. Um, like I said, I had some issues with Addison's character, you know, but you know, I've, I've never been in that situation really. Uh, so I, I don't know how I'd interpret that, but overall I say, this is a one that I'll look forward to rewatching when I rewatch the seasons. So I'm going to just, uh, give it a five bank codes, which is, hold on. You're going to give it the full five digits of the bank code. Eh? Yeah. You're wavering on the last one. Are you, are you coming in, coming in I'm, strong. I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it uh, five seven two nine four threes. The bank code to the vault, and also the zip code to Logan County, Arkansas. I I tried to connect that to one of the writers or producers. I couldn't. I don't know if they just came up with random numbers. Is that where the episode is set? Is it in Arkansas? I don't know. Because then, uh, then the the bank manager is just a an idiot dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> at least it wasn't one two three four five i thought it was that'd have philadelphia. been funny wasn't it philadelphia <laughs> right born and I raised don't, i don't remember i don't, I don't know remember. where they were that would have been funny if it the code is one two three four what is what's the last number what's the last number that would have been great but i'm gonna give it a full five bank codes uh because i i really enjoyed it i love everything and so that, far this season that reminds me of a funny joke i heard very very mm -hmm. corny but uh how do you find will smith in the snow Look for the Fresh Prince. Fresh Prince. I thought it was going to be something about the slap or something. So Fresh Prince, that's funny. Uh, but uh, overall, a good uh, good episode. Any any crazy theories about what's coming up this season? Uh, next week we have closer closure encounters. That's it. Closure encounters. Closure encounters. Yeah. Uh, I think that's they mentioned the, uh, something about Area Fifty One, maybe aliens or yeah. something. You are a government agent. Area 51. Seen any UFOs yet? What the? Where are you, Ben? Quantum Leap, next Wednesday on NBC and streaming on Peacock. Uh, so that'll be fun. So uh, any any theories about these next uh, episodes? We've got eight to go. No, eight in total. Six to go. Six to go. Zero theories. Zero. Uh, well, I don't think I don't think anything that I haven't mentioned the, the theories that I thought of like just now yeah. <laughs> that I, on on the show um, about the uh, potential Ziggy and 
I can't even remember what episode I said. Like rewind, rewind, dear listeners. Mm-hmm. And- <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, well, now that Ben is essentially single, I think we're going to see a far more sexually charged show. That's what I think mm. is going to be coming up. I can see that. Yeah, and and even if uh, they undo this, Ben's always going to know that you know she moved on. So I think that'll affect the relationship, even if they do get back together. I don't know. It's extenuating circumstances, time travel, you know. So who knows? Maybe if Ben resets it, he'll never know this happened. Even if he is technically free now, like I don't see him like jumping in, but he's still in love. He might he might yeah. accept that she's not with him, but I, I don't I don't see him, you know, just having a, a new lady of a show or yeah, yeah it was know. yesterday for him. It was yesterday for him. Yeah, I feel so bad for. I'm him. not opposed to it. Like I, th- I think I would, you know. Well, I, Sam was still very moral. Oh, it's wrong to sleep with someone you're not in love with. And for someone who bed hopped as much as he did, he seemed like a bit of a hypocrite. So I think we could still <laughs> see it. <laughs> True. Uh, that would be the ultimate payback, uh, Addison having to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Unhelpful. It'll be interesting. Uh, I, I really like, think need we to... need to really stop this now before we get an R rating. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Good we already Good we already call. got shark bites in your boobs, and luckily me and John kept our shirts on this time. So yeah, um, yeah. But uh, check out next week's episode, and um, it's uh, closure encounters. I'm excited for it. From the preview, it kind of looks X Filey's to me, and I'm a big X File fan, so I'm an X File, and uh, I'm I'm very interested to see if aliens exist in this universe because uh, they might. You never know. For the Quantum Leap Podcast, Quantum Leap After Show, I'm Albie. I'm John. And I'm Hayden, and I'm moving on with Bruce. (laughs) Okay, and we'll see you next time.